Okay, as we go into our project today, we are continuing to work on assignment one. And we want to make sure we have our sketch posted in Canvas to meet the deadline with something, but also to really showcase that this is our own vision. It's our idea of what the fantasy landscape can be. So to kind of highlight this, I took our process from the end of last class and I posted just a screenshot of it. You don't, you are not required to do that. I just do that so people kind of know where we got to and where we're starting today. And the process was we were rough cutting and placing things informed by our sketch, in this case, the vertical sketch. And based on the different resources we found, we sized them and placed them within these guidelines but we can always, I think I ended up growing the, the height and overall dimensions of my landscape a little bit because of my elements. And we ended up with something like this. So right now this looks for me like just a salad bowl. Everything is sharp. Everything's in focus. Everything's colorful. Everything's really contrasted. We don't really have a sense of those three layers of depth yet, but we've got things set up for that. So the intentions of the sketch now we need to make true in our coloring and in our refined cutting out and in our layering of these. But so that you understand how important our sketch and our vision was, what I did is I just made a text description of this idea and I put it into a stable diffusion text to image uh, AI image generator. You know, a vegetable jungle with celery trees and cabbage blossoms in the foreground, a mushroom soup lake with truffle boulders lined by a shredded chanterelle field in the middle ground, and kale and broccoli crowned mountains in the background under a cloudy sky with a setting beet red sun, right? So everything I've got here, everything here is vegetables, right? Nothing here is not vegetables. AI gives me something that has a very defined foreground, middle ground, background, but it doesn't have enough reference, you know, for my fantasy ideas to make the, the celery trees, right? Instead, it just kind of mixes, it makes like kind of a wallpaper of celery blossoms. And this is the best one I could get. And, and cabbage, red cabbage, white cabbage, and then just regular trees that maybe look a little bit like kale. And then regular mountains that aren't broccoli crowns at all. And I do like the sky, but what the AI does show is that we have a really defined language for foreground, middle ground, background. Foreground's always going to be the most contrasted, the most colorful, the, the most sharp focus. Middle ground is going to be what's behind that, <laughs> transitioning into the background, which is going to be the lowest contrast and the softest edged. And you could almost put anything with that kind of treatment and you'll get this illusion of three layers of depth. What would improve upon this is if we had something in the foreground that overlapped the middle ground, like I was able to do with this celery tree. So what I need to add to this is what the AI already knows, is that some of these elements should be sharper and more contrasted. Some of them should be softer and less contrasted. And that's going to add this kind of atmospheric depth into the references I already have. Also, we need to kind of clean up around some of the edges, right? And transition kind of the mushroom lake into the chanterelles. The, the mountains need to feel like they have a horizon line. The sky looks way too sharp in focus to be a sky. So these are the things we're going to work on today. And we're going to keep building our skills. So to do that, we're in PhotoP. We have our, our latest PSD file opened in PhotoP. And if you're grabbing it from your thumb drive, make sure you save it onto your computer. I would recommend your desktop. So this is the file I opened in PhotoP. That means every time I save it, it will save right to that spot and overwrite it. And as long as it's a PSD file I'm saving, I'm not going to lose any quality or any information as I go. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my guides. And that's command semicolon. So you can toggle your guides on and off with command semicolon. That's the area I intend to crop it. 
And where we left off last class, we were learning how to do some, some image adjustments. But look how beautifully this celery stalk is cut out and overlaps with everything else. That's just because I was lucky and I found celery as a PNG element on PhotoP, which was already cut out. But we need to learn how to cut things out that cleanly. So to do that, once I'm happy, I'm satisfied, I can hit Command S at any time to save it right in the spot I opened it from. Now what I'm going to do is strip back my layers by turning off the eyeballs until I get to my background layers. And thinking about three layers of depth and thinking about how I can use PhotoP to control every pixel. I now want to make this guy look kind of in the distance, kind of like this guy does. So how can I do that? So I can use direct image adjustments, like I believe I showed in our last video, though when, last Wednesday feels like a long time ago. And you do that by going up to, by selecting the layer, and then going to Image, Adjustments, Levels. That will adjust the lights and darks. I feel like I made it a little bit darker. You can also limit the highlights or limit the shadows with these sliders. And because I'm just working from my, my furthest background composite layer, it's really kind of whatever feels right to me at this point. I don't have anything to base it on. I'm not trying to match it to anything. And I just want some kind of depth behind the sky. So maybe it should feel a little bit deeper. Then I say, OK. I always start with levels, and then I go next to image adjustments, color balance. This is the color temperature. And I always do it to midtones first under range. So do I want it to go more red? Or do I want it to go more cyan, like light blue? For veggies, I think I want it to go a little bit more red. Do I want it to go towards more magenta or more green? I think I'll keep it right near the middle. Do I want it to go more yellow or more blue? Let's just goose it a little bit towards the blue. At this stage, I don't need to deal with highlights and shadows that much, but if I wanted to, I would usually push them in different directions. So usually I would add more warms like reds and yellows to my highlights and then in my shadows I would do the opposite add more cyans and blues to the shadows and then you can always use your history to see if you like what those levels did and it's very subtle the color balance but it helps a little bit now this is kind of my favorite part of compositing we're going to start taking focus away and blending. So we brought in very high resolution images. But if they're in the far background, like in the sky, you don't want things that are super sharp and contrasty because there's tons of atmosphere. There's tons of air molecules and pollution and things that get in the way of our scene sharp focus. It's why we can't tell exactly how many craters there are on the moon when we're looking at it from the surface, right? So how do we soften focus? Well, one way is to just play with opacity. So if you have like a floating moon on a sky, one way to sink it into the atmosphere a little bit is to just take that layer's opacity and just slide it on down. But if you still feel like you can get rid of some focus because you really want it to be pushed in the background, we can actually use for the first time a filter in the class. And this is going to be the only filter that we routinely try and use. Filters are like Instagram filters. They're like pre-built image manipulators that someone wrote and thought looked good. They're shortcuts that can be helpful, but if you don't know how they were made, they're not a great creative tool, right? They're instead like a crutch. But that is not true of the one we're gonna use, which is blur, Gaussian blur. Blur, Gaussian blur just simply softens the focus around pixels and we get to control how much computers are great at taking away information like focus they are not good at adding information so we spent all this time getting a really high res image 
Now we're going to intentionally take focus away from it. And you can just use this slider and you can decide how soft you want it to get, right? Not too soft, but you'll see that this is a big difference. So I'm going to use a radius of 15 pixels. That means every pixel, like a, a stone thrown into a pond, is going to ripple out for 15 pixels and soften all of the the contrast between them. And so when you multiply this with all the pixels, it becomes really blurry really fast. So that's what I have now. This is what I had before. And that gives me that nice kind of hazy, cloudy sky. Eventually, for my plan now, I can keep moving these guidelines where I want them. But yeah, the intention is all of this will get lost. The only reason I keep it is like some of the things I might want to still bring in into my field. So this is our actual image space, and then this is our canvas or our working space. Now I can also play with the levels adjustments, but before I do that, <clears throat> I can see what's going to go on top of it. So I have not a moon, not a sun, but this beat. How can I cut this beat out really cleanly? It's different for every object, you know, how to best select around and clean up the edge. So, but one option you always have is to just use your lasso directly and then just draw and cut out. And I'll usually do it in chunks, except I'm on the wrong layer. So draw and cut out. The closer you get in, the more you can kind of see what you're doing and control it. And how much do you want to zoom in? You never want to zoom in so much that you're actually seeing pixels in any way. You basically want to zoom in at most like 300 or 200% is really. That's what I'm at right now. It will tell me in the little bottom left-hand corner. That is twice as much as you can see with your naked eye on a full print. So 200%, if you're going any more than that, you're just kind of wasting your time. Because any flaws you see at 300%, which is the next level of zoom, your eye's not ever going to be able to see anyway when it's actually printed. So I could do this, but it's going to take a long time. And in this case, if I know I want this to be a sun, and I know I want it to be really circular, I can use, instead of the lasso tool, I can use one of the shaped marquee selection tools. So in this case, the ellipse marquee tool. This is a lot like making a vector shape. But instead of making a vector shape with it, we're going to be making a selection. So I'm going to hold down shift, and that will make it a perfect circle. And then I can let go of shift and just move that circle into what I want to select, like there. And then I can hit command J and make a little cookie cutter of it and then delete what's behind. We're used to that. Or I can say select inverse that will swap the selection to everything outside that circle and then just hit delete. And now I have a perfect circle of my beat. Now, is there room for improvement? A little bit of green got in there. A little bit of the peel got in there. I could always hit command Z, go back. And then when you're on the selection tool, you can just, and you have an active selection going, you can use the arrow keys to nudge it. In this case, just move it down a little bit. Maybe a little bit more and a little bit to the right. And you can find exactly where you want it. And you can always resize it or redo it as well. And now I'm going to do select, inverse, and delete. Select, inverse, and delete. All right. So here's the issue. I just cut it out exactly as a circle. Very similar to a vector shape tool. So my edge is perfectly clean. But things in the background, like in the AI here, the edge of that mountain is not perfectly sharp. Because the fuzziness of atmosphere doesn't only make internal contrast less, 
It also makes edge contrast less 